hello, hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. I'm very excited to be here with all of you. My name is Teresa Okokin, and I am the co-host of Stories from the Stage, and I am delighted to welcome you to Beyond the Page with GBH. Now, in a few moments, we're going to be joined by S.J. Sindhu, the author of Blue Skin Gods, Marriage of a Thousand Lies, and I Once Met You, But You Were Dead. Now, before we get started with our conversation with Sindhu, I want to explain how this evening's event is going to work. We, of course, are in a Zoom environment and, you know, this many months into the pandemic, uh, we are all at different uh, levels of understanding, understanding and awareness with Zoom. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page with things. Um, first off, as an audience, we cannot see you, unfortunately, um, and we can't hear you either. We can't hear you speaking, but we do want to hear from you. So the way that you can do that is by asking questions during the course of our conversation by using the Q&A tab, which is down towards the bottom of your screen and typing your questions into that. Um, you can put in questions now and or at any point throughout our conversation. And I'm gonna do my very best to address the questions um, that you are asking as we make our way through the evening. If you see a question that's already in the Q&A tab um, and you want an answer to it, you can upvote that question by clicking the thumbs up icon that's in the Q&A tab or next to the question somewhere around there. Um, the most popular questions then will rise up to the top of the Q&A tab and as I said, I'm going to do my best to be picking the questions that are at the top of that list. Now, I also want to remind you that Zoom has closed captioning um, as a function um, in this environment. So to activate that, you're going to pick the closed caption button towards the bottom of your screen. I think it's like a, a rectangle with the letter C or CC in it. Um, and when you do that, you're going to get um, two options that pop up. Um, or you, you'll pick live transcript and then you'll get two options that pop up. I would recommend that the option that you pick is subtitle. That's gonna enable the captioning to just appear at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript if you would like. If you select full transcript, it's gonna open a sidebar window um, and that's where you'll be able to read along and see um, what everybody is saying. We also have some um, descriptions and instructions for that going on in the chat for you. Um, please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. So just keep that in mind as we're moving forward. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce SJ Sindhu. Sindhu was born in Sri Lanka and raised in Massachusetts. She is the author of two literary novels, two hybrid chapbooks, and a forthcoming graphic novel, a very busy individual indeed. Um, her first novel, Marriage of a Thousand Lies, won the Publishing Triangle Edmund White Award and was a Stonewall Honor Book and a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. Sindhu's second novel, which I have here, Blue Skin Gods, was published this past November, and she's set to release her newest chapbook, Dominant Genes, later this month. Sindhu has an MA in English creative writing from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and a PhD in English from Florida State University, and she teaches at the University of Toronto, Scarsborough. Please join me in welcoming S.J. Sindhu. Sindhu, how are you doing? I'm awesome. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and for being with us this evening. I really, really appreciate you sharing your time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This yeah, really totally. Exciting. Totally. So the format of Beyond the Page traditionally was that um, the sort of a online book club that everybody would read one book, but we wanted to push out and expand that even further. And so for the first month with you, um, our book club members were able to read any of your books um, and then come to this and just kind of have a general conversation about you as a writer and your work in general. So we're hoping to have a really broad discussion. So to get us started in that, I'm curious about um, your writing process in general, um, through any of the books or chapbooks or other stories that you've written, what sparks you to write the stories that you choose? I usually start with um, like one piece, uh, whether that's a character, um, sometimes that's just a title, uh, sometimes it's um, like just a concept or an idea, 
Uh, and, and, and sometimes it's more than one thing, right? When mm -hmm. I started Blue Skinned Gods, I was starting with like two or three pieces. I wanted, I knew I wanted a, a kid who was um, sort of believed to be holy in some mm -hmm. way. I knew I wanted um, blue skin involved and I had the title before I even began. Mm. Uh, with my first book with marriage, um, I didn't have the title at all. The title was a late edition. All I knew was that I wanted to write a story about a marriage of convenience um, and I wanted to explore queerness and South Asian identity. And like, that's what I knew. So like, I always start with like one or two things. And then um, as, you know, as my career has sort of advanced, my writing style has changed. My writing process has changed, which is really interesting. I didn't expect that to happen, mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel like I do a lot more pre-writing now. Like I do a lot more planning, a lot more like uh, development of character, um, development of plot before I even start writing, which yeah. definitely wasn't the case uh, early on in my in my writing career <laughs> yeah and maybe that sort of explains and kind of gets into how with your second novel you know you had the title and a lot of these concepts ahead of time and with the first one not so much that's really that's an interesting process um I'm from Wisconsin so I apologize if my accent was off but you have the two novels and two chap books sometimes when I speak too quickly um my words get caught in my mouth and someone thought I was saying chat books um but I think we had a question from Carol in Watertown and I think folks would love to understand the difference in general between what is the difference between a chap book and a novel so a chat book is essentially a collection of something. It can be poetry, it can be like flash fiction, it can be essays, or sometimes in my case, it's hybrid stuff. So um, it can be a combination of any of those things. A chat book is just a small book. Um, mm. It's usually, you know, 40 to 60 pages. So it's mm. not a it's not a big book um, in the same ways, but it's it's like the perfect thing to read when you're like, on the tea or uh you know you're you're just like you know sitting down at the dentist's office or something like that's that's what a chapbook is meant to do is to like give you um a whole experience of a book but in a very small package yeah and so for your chat books in from one story to another are they is is there a character that's traveling from one story to another or is each story independent so in um, I Once Met You But You Were Dead, it's a hybrid collection of nonfiction and fiction, um, but the fiction and nonfiction are not marked. So there's this, um, what I wanted was like this, this interesting slippage between like what's real and what's not real. And most of the stuff is, is written in and told in first person. So mm. there's a narrator, but is that, is that narrator the same across all the stories? And that's really mm. um, up to you as a reader to, to make that decision. Um, my second chapbook, Dominant Genes, which comes out in just over a month from now. <laughs> Very um, exciting. Yeah, it's, uh, that one's actually poetry and nonfiction. So mm. um, it's the first time I've really published poetry in book form. So I'm a little nervous about that. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's sort of doing the same things, um, where there is a speaker and it's unclear whether that speaker is the same from, uh, from moment to moment, but, but that's intentional and that's part of the experience of reading. And I understand that you're originally from Sri Lanka. Um, so I'm curious about how, um, your cultural background kind of goes into the development of the characters that you write for your fiction in particular? Yeah, um, I'm really interested in identity, um, all uh, identity of all sorts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, racial identity, class identity, ethnic identity, gender, sexuality, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, because I was born in Sri Lanka, um, but I was already an ethnic minority. I was a linguistic and religious minority within Sri Lanka itself. Uh, and then we moved, um, there was a civil war in Sri Lanka. Mm. So my family moved um, to Massachusetts and we spent a long time sort of moving around Massachusetts, Amherst, Winchester, Waltham, 
and then uh, moved to South Dakota. So just, we just moved all, everywhere. Yeah. Um, and that constant process of displacement, even in Sri Lanka, we were moving around quite a bit. So I don't, yeah. I think I've determined I haven't lived in a place longer than four years or wow. so. Wow. Um, like in one city <laughs> longer yeah. than yeah. that. So, um, so that constant process of displacement is also like a constant reinvention of identity, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's a, every new place is an opportunity to ask yourself that question again. Who am I? Mm. Am I the same person as the person who lived in the last place or am I a different person? And so I'm really interested in, in questions of identity. Um, and, and I think all of my characters struggle with their identity in some form or another. So in Marriage mm-hmm. for a Thousand Lies, Lucky is struggling with her sexuality and she, you know, wants to come out, but doesn't really know how and doesn't, doesn't want to risk losing her family. Um, in Blue Skinned Gods, you know, Kalki, the main character is struggling with this question of like, am I divine or have I been duped and have I been duping mm-hmm. other people? Mm-hmm. Um, and then as he grows up, you know, these questions kind of change and shift. And um, so, so I'm, that's the, 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 the identity, I think, is, is like the overarching theme of my work so far. Yeah. yeah, I can see that. And I think I the book that I read was Blue Skin Gods, um, which I really loved. And part of what I found interesting about sort of Kalki's search for identity or understanding of identity was that it went beyond like, am I this or am I that? did I do people? Um, it was also like, what does it mean that I believed that I was one thing? What does it mean that I now believe this other thing? What does any of it mean? You know, like it, it, it went well beyond what the what of it, but like, what does that mean? What do I do with that information now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, the, the complications and complexities and nuances of identity and how it changes. But not just like, yeah, you're right. Like, it's it's not just the what of it. The what mm-hmm. of the identity is the least interesting part to me. It's the how and the why and, yeah. and everything that surrounds it. Yeah, definitely. It definitely pushes well beyond that um, in really, really interesting ways. Um, we have a question from Kathy, um, particularly about um, Kelki's character, but maybe we can expand this to talking about some of the other characters. Um, and that question is, why didn't Kelki look up his friends from the past? Like when his friend had moved to the United States, why didn't he look that friend up? And um, do you ever think about your your characters in general, the things that they do or the things that they don't do, um, and thinking about why why you made those decisions and how you made those decisions? Yeah, I mean it's it's sort of a torturous process, right, to figure <laughs> out like what what is the most organic uh, decision for the character at this particular moment, and for Kelki, like. Um, I think when Lakshman moves away, like he's so, at that point, he's just in the ashram and he's so isolated and he's Mm -hmm. so sheltered there. And and he literally has no access, right? Like there's no uh, um, computers allowed at the ashram. There's no mobile phones allowed at the ashram. And so he doesn't physically have access to these things. Um, And then, you know, he hears about this this, uh, internet cafe in the village, but like Mm -hmm. he knows that if he goes, he, and he gets caught, which of course, like all the villagers would immediately recognize who he is. Um, he would face severe punishment. And so like, mm-hmm. you know, there, there's a lot of layers to uh, what's stopping him from looking at these people. Uh, but I also like the, the adult Kalki that's narrating um, mm-hmm. beyond all this does have access, right? Like he, he knows what happens to several people. Um, Kalyani, for example, who he meets as a 10 year old uh, and she's a little trans girl who visits the ashram um, mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and um, she is essentially like visits for a little while and leaves. Um, but adult Kalki is able to give us, give us where she ends up. Like he's able to tell us what happens to her later on. So he, mm-hmm. he definitely is aware of the other um, like where the other characters are. Uh, and I think, you know, adult Kalki is speaking from present time. Right. Um, and this is, and, and child Kalki is like, you know, in, in 
the late 90s or early 2000s so it's not it's really like the 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 um the proliferation of technology is very very different so that's i wanted to make true. sure that that's that was reflected that that's that, very uh, true you know that that it was true to the time period of where he is at a particular moment and i'm curious if it ever takes like in the process of writing your books if it ever takes um um like another reader or an editor to read a section and bring up those kinds of questions like do you find that usually that's the prompt that you need is someone to ask you why didn't this happen or why didn't that happen or are you able to write it and then go back and read your own work and ask those questions and find those kinds of holes I am extremely dependent <laughs> on other readers. Uh, I so I have a um, while I was writing Blue Skin Gods. Well, while while I was writing Marriage for Thousand Lies, I was in my master's program at mm. the University of Nebraska, and I started writing it in a novel class actually, where we were you know workshopping each other's novels. So uh, and and then so like I had that feedback early on, and then I kept mm -hmm. going and kept getting more and more feedback. That ended up being my um, my master's thesis. So I had my my committee that was giving me feedback. Uh, and then Blue Skinned Gods was my dissertation for mm. uh, my PhD. So I also workshopped it in class and I workshopped it with many times. Yes, yeah, so many times. And, and, and I really have come to love that process. Um, you know, I, I I teach creative writing, and so a lot of my students hate workshopping at first because they're like, I don't want people reading my stuff. It's like, you know, it's like somebody looking through my dirty laundry and then like telling me how to wash everything, and they're like, I don't like it. And I and I'm like, but but you, I think part of being a writer, especially a writer who wants to be published and and sort of in the public sphere mm -hmm. and part of the community, is that you mm -hmm. you have to get used to that process that's, yeah. that's part of the writing process because if it's not a workshop group it's going to be your editor or it's going to be your agent or it's going to be readers that's even worse some random person on the internet yeah <laughs> right exactly yeah. this is why you don't read goodreads reviews <laughs> or your own amazon reviews like I, I i i think like i've hit that stage where i'm like okay the other day i was like all right no longer will i be reading my goodreads reviews uh <laughs> or anything that comes through the Google alerts on into my mailbox. Um, but yeah, now, I mean, I'm, I'm married to a, a writer, a poet, um, uh, his name's Jeff Bouvier, and he's, he has two books and another one coming out. So he's, you know, very accomplished. Um, and he's my first reader and he mm. definitely, uh, like goes line by line through my work. Um, Asks I have a writing questions. group. Yeah. Right. I have a writing group of um, some of my friends from my PhD program, and they've been really great in 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 being that kind of reader for me. And I also have uh, for Blue Skinned Gods specifically because I was writing um, a trans character and mm -hmm. a Dalit character. I uh, had sensitivity readers, sensitivity not sensitivity readers, readers yeah. to to help me because I wanted to make sure that um, I wasn't doing anything dumb, which I, I did. And they, you know, we worked through it and they were great and they pointed it out. And, um, but, the, but like that kind of feedback is essential. I, I can't imagine doing any kind of writing without the whole, without the whole process is, is so important. And I think that a lot of times people kind of think that like a writer just writes a book and then they publish it. And it's like, there is a lot of, there's a lot of steps that come before around and after that. Um, I, I like to tell my students that um, workshopping is like a moment where the entire room is only going to be focused on you and only going to be talking about your precious thoughts, you know, <laughs> like, and I'm a deeply conceited person. So who wouldn't want to just like have everyone talk about them? Like that's when you get to listen. Exactly. Like that sounds like a delight. It's my dream life. Um, we have Swati asking in the chat for a bit of a process question if if you can distinguish between workshopping and regular editing like what what is what is the difference between those two things in the process that's a great like question what happens in a workshop and what happens in editing to me workshopping is more developmental it's it it occurs earlier on in the process and you are 
uh, essentially doing it with more than one person. Usually mm -hmm. you're, you have a group, uh, either a class or, or like a writing group or something. Um, and they're giving you developmental feedback early on. So after a first, second draft, um, and you're talking about big macro things like giant plot holes and characters that aren't working and all these big things. Mm -hmm. And to me at this point, like, it's really rare to do that really with an editor um, because most editors by the time, like are only acquiring work that's pretty much ready to be published. So at that mm. stage, um, especially if you have an agent or you're working with an agent, you, you've already gone through developmental edits with your agents as well. Um, so that to me, that's more revision, that's more workshopping. And then you get to a more polished stage and mm -hmm. you get the sort of editing where like this scene needs work or like you need to amp up some of the dialogue here or like it's like small stuff um sometimes just as uh heavy uh, in terms of work mm -hmm. but um but smaller stuff line level sure. editing that kind of stuff um so like by the time blue skin gods went to soho it was pretty much done and that that's true for most novels that are selling now I, I thank you for that. I want to remind our audience um, that the Q&A is open. So please put your questions in the Q&A and um, be upvoting them so that I can be sure to be getting them to Sindhu here. Um, Sindhu, we have a question um, from Alicia in Rhode Island, um, who is like many of us red, blue skin gods and is wondering, um, since it addresses a bunch of different or at least two different time, pers time perspectives, like two separate times in Kelki's life, um, child Kelki and adult Kelki. In the writing process, did you start with adult Kelki or did you start with child child Kelki? And maybe even for some of your other books, when your characters are spanning across time, do you first like envision, like is your first entry point to that character at a certain time of their life or the whole arc of it or what? what's the process? I think certain, like it's, it, comes down to voice and the sort of narrative possibilities for me. Uh, I wanted Marriage for a Thousand Lies to feel very immediate and like mm. in the moment. And, and it's a very like small timeline. There's like four months and it, it's over the course of four months. So it, I wanted it to feel like, you know, very present right now, immediate. And so it's written in first person, present tense. And there is no like retrospective, mm. um, you know, piece. Uh, no retrospective character who's like coming in and telling you what happens after. Uh, but for Blue Skinned Gods, the way I imagined it was as like I want, I knew I wanted a child character, but writing a child character in the immediate voice gives a lot of restrictions in terms of what you can include and how you right. can tell the story. If it's a first person child, you, your voice has to sound like a 10 like the child right 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 and and that really erases a lot of nuance from the story that I didn't want to erase I wanted that perspective of mm -hmm. the older Kalki being able to sort of hold our hand through the story uh so I knew that I was gonna right? have like yeah. come, come with that wisdom too yes yeah to to come with the wisdom them and to be able to help us process some of this stuff that child Kalki can't process in the moment. Right. Um, so I knew that that was going to have to be um, what the story was like to have the adult and the, and, the, mm -hmm. and the child and then the middle like the teenage sort of young adult Kalki who's you know starting to experiment and um, the what changed though throughout the course of uh revising all of this is the structure so mm. you know I, I first started with a chronological structure that is actually very close to what you see mm. but then a lot of it wasn't working and so I, I cut it up and uh, at some point this novel had like two different timelines and like mm. there was like the ashram timeline and there was the New York City timeline and they were like inter interlocked in a lot of oh, ways interesting um but that also didn't quite work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I ended up returning it back into chronological and I, and I think it works better. Um, but I, I feel like they're like that conception of retrospective Kelki looking back in his life never really changed, but like everything mm -hmm. else about it was, mm -hmm. um, was up in the air for a long time. Yeah. I really, I particularly enjoyed those 
moments when um, adult Kalki would just be like talking very specifically about their life now, you know, and like um, things that like child Kalki probably could have never even imagined, um, but would sort of just get dropped in there because it was related to what the, what child Kalki or like, you know, 20-ish or New York Kalki, first time in New York Kalki was, was experiencing. I really enjoyed that. Um, we're going to take a break in a moment, but before we do, I have a question from Sarah Wu, who also read um, Blue Skin Gods and asked, I enjoyed the way that you explored um, the concept of identity, not only with Kalki, but also very successfully, successfully with many other characters. It also struck me over and over as I was listening to the book, the way that we all have the basic need to belong. We're all looking for connection. It drives so many of our decisions, which in turn leads to unforeseen consequences. So do you think a lot about the human need for connection, connection or belonging as you're writing your characters? Yes, I, I, I think that sort of isolation um, that I, I think we all feel at times in our lives um, is a big driving force in my writing. Um, uh, it's, it's something that I have thought about a lot and it's something that I've observed a lot in, mm -hmm. in not just myself, but a lot of other people. And I, it's, it's a way of connecting across identity for me, yeah. you know, like everyone feels alone at some point and we all know what that feels like. And so no matter what kind of identity my characters have, that's different from what my readers have, uh, that feeling is a way to unite people. Just like, you mm -hmm. know, everyone, like that dysfunctional family dynamic is, is, mm -hmm. is a common theme that cuts across cultures. And so like, these are, these are ways that I want the, the, to open up the story so that the audience can sort of connect with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Sindhu, uh, we talked a little bit about your upcoming chap book. Um, that is dominant genes, right? And I think you said that that's a uh, um, sort of mashup of poetry and nonfiction. And we had someone mention in the Q and A about how excited they are to read your poetry. Uh, you definitely have just a beautiful approach to words on a page. Um, so I'm wondering if you can preview um, dominant genes for us a bit. Just kind of tell us about what what it's about, what it's what it's approaching, and what it's addressing. Sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I'm married to a poet. So at some point, but I've never taken a poetry class in my life, mm -hmm. um, which I regret now. And at the beginning <laughs> of the pandemic, I was like, okay, just teach me poetry. Just tell me all the things like run a master class for me. So he started doing like these one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, lectures with me and I started writing a bunch of poetry mm -hmm. and what I've been thinking about a lot. Um, Cause I, you know, I moved I'm, I'm from, you know, the Boston area originally, but I moved to Toronto, uh, where most of my extended family lives. And I've been thinking a lot about heritage and legacy and mm. family, and especially uh, like my family ten is, is coming from a very matriarchal tradition. Mm. And I've been thinking a lot about like matriarchal lineage and what that means and what we, what we inherit from our, from our mothers and what we pass on. Uh, so that's kind of, the, the, the basis for the meditations that are in the chat book is really mm. about um, sort of mother-daughter uh, relationships and thinking about um, uh, matrilineal heritage and asking those questions of like, you know, what, what did we inherit uh, unintentionally and what do we want to inherit? Ah, really, really interesting. Well, I think we could, we all definitely have that book to look forward to. So I'm, I'm definitely going to check it out. Um, I'm curious as well, a little bit, if, if, if you can talk a bit about um, queerness in the characters um, that, that you write, um, why you include queerness in, in your characters, if that was um, kind of how that happened, if it was just like natural for you, if you were like, yeah, queer people exist and so they're gonna be part of my book or, or is it more intentional or how, how, does, that, how does that happen for you? I mean, for, uh, um, for me, you know, I came out when I was 17 
And it, queerness was a large part of my identity for a long time because I, I was also a community activist and I was really involved in the queer rights movement in Nebraska when I was in college. And so it, it became a large part of who I, 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 I think of myself as, yeah. you know, this, yeah. this person, the, the, these identities that I hold are very much wrapped up in queerness. And, and I also studied um, queer theory as a scholar mm. and queer literature. So that's part of my specialty um, in terms of scholarship. So it's, it's definitely a large part of my life. I spend a, a, lar a large portion of my time thinking about these issues. So to me, it's, it's, it's natural to yeah. include queer characters. Uh, my first book, um, Marriage of a Thousand Lies. I was. It was very much a, a, like built around this idea of queerness and and trying to make peace with queerness and other identities. Mm. But um, with Blue Skinned Gods and and I have a graphic novel, two graphic novels coming out, um, 2023 and 2024, uh, with some queer themes. But after marriage, I was kind of like, okay. I want to write stories that have queer characters, but that aren't about being queer mm. because not all of our stories are always about being queer. Sometimes you just have a story with like magic and swords and the character just happens to be queer, which right. I, I think, you know, I feel that way with like, with um, like race and ethnicity as well. Mm -hmm. like I want black and brown characters whose stories aren't just about being black and brown. Like they right. just happen to be, but also they have other things to like, their, yeah. their stories are so, about something else. We have whole lives. Um, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah, we have full lives that, that don't just revolve about, around one thing. Right. Um, so that's, that's, that was kind of the, the goal and the thought process behind um, the queer characters, at least in Blue Skin Gods. Yeah, I love that. And I also just really loved that there wasn't, there was like um, no additional explanation or like a feeling of apology that was happening on the page. I think so frequently que queer characters are written like they have to explain themselves or be sorry about who they are. And I think that that influences queer culture in general, that it, that it's like coming out as sometimes seen as an apology or sometimes seen as like a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I just really, really appreciated the um, way that you approached your characters on the page, the, the trans characters and the non-binary characters in Blue Skin Gods in, in particular. So thank you so much for, for that tenderness. Um, we're gonna take a quick break. Um, my colleague Sandy is gonna be coming on with some information from GBH. So Sandy, can you join us please? Hi, thank you so much, Teresa. What a wonderful conversation. And hello to everyone at home. I'm Sandy Chen from GBH's Member Engagement Department. And thank you for joining us tonight. You know, the great thing about books and GBH is both are commercial free and GBH is member supported. And that means we're here because you want us here. Our commercial free status also means we rely on audience support. And if you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member or make a one-time donation of $60, you will receive an autographed copy of Sindhu's upcoming collection of nonfiction essays and poetry, Dominant Genes, as our thank you gift to you. And giving is as simple as it is secure, and there are three ways to do so. You can give by visiting gbh.org slash support events or text GBH to 800-204 3811 using the keyword GBH to donate. Or go ahead and scan the QR code right here on the screen to open the secure donation form on your smartphone. You at home can help bring more stories to life. And if you wish to become a GBH sustainer, please click on the support link in the Zoom chat or text GBH to 800-204-3811. Or like I said, go ahead and scan that QR code right here to show your support. And to show our appreciation, we will happily send you Sindhu's new book, Dominant Genes, as a thank you gift. And if you're already a GBH member, thank you so much for your support and thank you for listening. And now back to Teresa with more of your questions. Thank you so much, Sandy. What a cool prize. Very exciting to be able to get Sindhu's new chat book. So I hope people uh, check that out. 
Sindhu will be joining me back here on the screen in just a moment and we'll um, get rolling back into the Q&A. Um, so Sindhu, we had a comment um, or maybe a little bit of a question from Claire and Don that said that Kelki's issue is fascinating. Kelki is um, the main character in Blue Skin Gods, um, that Kelki's issue is fascinating um, additionally, because in a sense, we are all divine or have a divine essence, especially to non-dualists. Um, so he is a god, but doesn't understand the meaning of it. Um, so I'm wondering um, how that impacted uh, your approach to Kelki's character. Was, was there a thought process around what does divine mean? Yes, definitely. I was, um, I was thinking, you know, I didn't want to constrain myself to one religion, even though I was writing very deeply about one very particular religion. And I, it, it's not just Hinduism, right? Like, there's many, many, Hinduism is, is what the British called a very loosely connected um, set of beliefs that were very regional and, and familial. So, mm. uh, you know, this particular, very, very particular type of Hinduism that uh, Kalki's family and, and sort of area believe is not what many other people believe. So um, I wanted to think about divinity in a, in a large scale way. Um, and I think you know, Kalki's father, who's positioning himself, like Kalki as a, as a healer, as a guru, right. is also thinking about faith in a very large way, because the larger he can expand that circle, the more uh, people he can take under the wing of the ashram. So maybe that's not the best, <laughs> you know, the, the <laughs> most wholesome motivation, but, but it is the same thing, right? Like you're trying to expand the circle of what, what is faith. Um, for me, I think what I was really thinking about was the ways in which we as children think of ourselves as mm -hmm. the center uh, mm -hmm. of our worlds and the, the worlds of our parents. We, we think ourselves as little gods, essentially, right? Like we, we accept that kind of divinity for ourselves. And as we grow older, as we get, you know, slapped around by life, that that start that sense of of the divine starts to leak away uh, mm. or we start to place it in other things right like um god exists elsewhere not inside me right mm -hmm. so uh, that's that's the kind of like sort of growing up um in terms of faith that i was trying to track through uh, a more outward expression mm -hmm. of Kalki's um Kalki's own journey is, is, is be, as somebody who was literally told he's a child God, um, he, his, you know, his journey is the same as ours. It's just more explicit. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that some of the other, um, as the book moved forward, some of the other characters and other child God characters that he, that he met, um, kind of spoke to that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a question from Janet Grover, um, who has been doing some reading about the civil wars, um, I think in Sri Lanka, um, and by authors who've been affected by them. And she's wondering if she can ask if your family background is Tamil or Sinhalese. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, I'm Tamil. Um, my family is Tamil. We, uh, we lived um, in the Northeast and the North of Sri Lanka. So most of my childhood um, was, you know, was living in uh, war affected areas. Mm -hmm. um, and part of our immigration story is, you know, that of displacement and, and um, we aren't, aren't legally classified as refugees, but, um, but we did leave Sri Lanka because of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, um, that's something I've been you know, struggling to write about for a very long time. It's why I started writing in the first place but it's also been the hardest thing to write about. So there's a little bit of it in my chat books, mm. um, both Dominant Genes and I Once Met You But You Were Dead, but I haven't written about it in novel form yet. Um, I'm just starting now. So I'm my second graphic novel, which is called Tall Water. It'll come out in 2024. Um, that deals with the tsunami that happened, uh, the Boxing Day tsunami in 2004 in mm. Sri Lanka. Uh, so this, um, it essentially tells the story of a, of, a, of a girl who goes back home to Sri Lanka to find her mother and gets caught in the tsunami. 
Um, and, and through that story, I'm also exploring the war um, and its impact. And my third literary novel, which I'm working on now is called War Child and it directly um, explores my, uh, it's, it's, you know, part of its auto fiction. So it mm. explores my relationship with the war, my experience of the war. Um, and it's not just war, right? Like the Sri Lankan government is being uh, investigated by the UN for genocide and war crimes. So right. it, it was a very systematic uh, um, extermination of, of the Tamil people, which, which is so horrific that it's hard to write. You know, anything that horrific is super hard to write about, especially yeah. if you've experienced it. Yeah, um, I was gonna say, like, especially yeah. having gone through it, then you're, you know, all of your own traumas are gonna come up in that process. Yeah, it's it's why I haven't really, you know, I, I started writing about it and it really triggered a lot of PTSD. So I haven't really, you know, mm. ra- r- written about it in a long time. Uh, but I just started, you know, in with these two books to to try and really delve into it. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's slow. Mm-hmm. It's a slow process. It takes longer than just writing straight up fiction. Yeah. Um, which, yeah. So, but, but I'm glad that I'm doing it. And I hope that, I hope that it connects with people because honestly, most of the literature that exists in English about the war is written by people who haven't experienced it firsthand. Mm-hmm. So, and, and a lot of people who have experienced it firsthand aren't writing about it. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, there's this weird divide um, that I'm hoping, you know, like that I can at least add another perspective as, as somebody who has actually experienced the war. Um, I can, I, I hope that I can, I can sort of bring a side to that story there, that yeah, maybe absolutely. hasn't fully been told yet. Absolutely. There's a perspective that you can bring that very few other people can, right? Um, it's mm-hmm. just a matter of like, the, you know, the horrible dredge that that's involved right. in bringing that perspective, which I'm sure is why very few other people have. Um, but yeah, definitely appreciate your work on that. You, we've talked a little bit about the graphic novels, and I'm just curious about like the process of writing those. Are you doing your own illustrations for them? How did you get into that kind of work? Just tell us more about how that goes. Yeah, um, I am not doing my own <laughs> illustrations. <laughs> I would love to be able to, and I, you know, as a child, I, I spent, I was a very obsessive child, just uh, so you know, before I tell you this, <laughs> but I spent like two to three hours every single day practicing drawing. And this is one of those things where maybe ta- like natural, you have to have some level of natural talent because I just couldn't cut it, even mm-hmm. though I spent so long trying to do it, um, trying to master the visual form. It just was not happening for me. Uh, but I did grow up reading a lot of um, a lot of graphic novels, a lot of manga. Mm. Um, so I um, I just wrote the script, uh, the scripts, I guess, two scripts, mm-hmm. and um, and it sold to to Harper Collins, and uh, they found. Thank you. Um, they found uh, the, or they suggested a couple of uh, illustrators, and we actually got my my top choice. Um, this very supremely talented oh, illustrator named Nabi H. Ali. Yeah, um, and, and you know, I just started getting uh, illustrations for the first time for the, for the first book, so that's- And what really is exciting. that like? What's, what's that process like of, of seeing your words be like manifested and envisioned by somebody else? How, how does that feel? I cried. <laughs> Uh, the first time I, I saw it, I cried and I felt so silly, mm. but it's just, it's when your work is interpreted by another artist, mm-hmm. it's, it's a, it's a, it's a strange feeling of, of like being seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and yes, you know, readers read your work and that's really, it's really edifying, but to have another artist sort of see what you're doing and like participate in it. Yes. Yeah. I can't explain that feeling. I cried. I, I, I cried when I heard, um, when I listened to the audiobook of um, Blue Skinned Gods, because it was like, you know, my words, but also my brother is the narrator for Blue Skinned Gods, the audiobook. Oh, um, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so he's he's a voice actor based in Boston, and and so he did the 
um, the audiobook, but when I just like hearing the words like interpreted by not just like read, but interpreted by a voice actor was just, yeah, it was overwhelming. Yeah. I was wondering about that same process of having your work interpreted by a voice actor because I read um, Blue Skin Gods on audiobook. I actually read it in one day. Um, I sort of, I was like, okay, I have the weekend to do this. It was the long weekend. Um, it's an 11 hour audiobook. And I was like, I'm going to do four hours on Saturday, four hours on Sunday, and the last two hours on Monday. And I got to the first four hours and I was like, yeah, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, and then I got a few more hours in and I was like, I'm not, I'm this far in, I should just keep going. And by the time I had probably two hours left, I was like, I'm not going to wait. Like, I want to know how this ends. You know, I want to know how we get to the end. And I'm always so curious about how um, a voice actor is selected um, for an audiobook. Have has your brother, do you have other audiobooks? Does your brother always do the readings? Um, how do you select a person to do that? How does that process go for you? Um, well, usually they just cast someone, right? <laughs> um, uh, so for, for Marriage of a Thousand Lies, they cast um, Emily Zhu Weller and, and she did a great job. Um, but, you know, I didn't have any anything to do with that process. Mm. For Blue Skin Gods, I knew we needed a male narrator, but um, my, my brother was getting into voice acting and started doing stuff. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. Like, mm. I was very concerned because, um, you know, this is very deeply entrenched in uh, Tamil culture and yes. the Tamil language. Like, I wanted to make sure that all the Tamil words were said correctly, that like, and like, there's a certain um, level of, you know, the, not having to explain it that happens when you have like, like um, Nabi H. Ali, who's doing the illustrations for, for my graphic novel is also mm -hmm. Tamil. And so I don't have to explain to him how mm -hmm. to like how the shrine at the house should look. Like looks. he just yeah. knows. Mm -hmm. um, I can just say sorry. And he's like, okay, I'll just, I, I know how to draw a sari and I know what kind of sari they might be wearing. Like, I don't have to explain anything and it's beautiful. And, yeah. and that's, that's another level of being seen. Um, so for, for Blue Skin Gods, I requested that uh, my brother be given an audition. So they were like, yes, we can audition him. That so, makes so he, much sense. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking in particular with the amount of pronunciation um, that I was just like, this is such a specific manuscript that like there, it's a, it's a very narrow group of people who can read this and really do it the service that this piece of art deserves, you know. Um, so yeah, and plus I love Keep It In The Family, that's fantastic. Um, we have a couple of um, sp more specific questions about um, Blue Skin Gods. So Olivia is wondering if you're familiar with the book, um, the book of woman, the book woman of Troublesome Creek. That's the title of the book. Um, the incidents of blue skin in rural Kentucky is a central character feature in this book. Um, and there was a family photo showing one of the families. Um, there's also an explanation of the treatment which temporarily changes the skin color back to normal. Um, so yeah, just some folks curious if you, um, maybe that book came up in your research um, for blue skin gods. I was also just curious in general, um, where like where that where that idea came from how how did we get here um i i know of the book i have not read it um but uh i definitely did come across the the few gates of kentucky um the family that mm -hmm. the the family that's historically documented to have had this um particular like problem uh, feature condition of, of uh, condition <laughs> yes um yeah condition uh well by the time this book came out I think it came out 2019 I want to say mm -hmm. um the the book Woman of Troubles and Creek came out in 2019 um I was already two years no I started Blue Skin Gods in 2014 so I was oh, already wow. you know I was already deep, deep in into the book. Deep I was, I, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I sold it in 2019. 
mm. I'm pretty sure, um, like the early part of 2019. So um, I I was so like, I you know, I sold it and then this book came out and I was like, oh, this is weird. Um, <laughs> and that was a weird confluence. But um, but yeah, no, I, I, I came across this book after I, I wrote it. That, that sort of incident came up recently on a writing Facebook group that I'm in of people talking. I think they were talking about like, yeah, it's related, like having a theme in your book that you've been working on for years. Um, and then a book gets published um, and it's around the same theme. And what what do you do? Because it's like, it's not like you were like, you can't control what everybody else is doing, you know, like, there's no way for you to know, and there's no way for them to know what you're doing. So how did, how do you feel when that happens? How do you approach that? I mean, I just, I, I just say you write the book you want to write and hope for the best. And, and writing is such a long process that, you know, like working on a book, you work on it for years and years and years. And then there's this publishing lag, right? Like there's mm -hmm. two years or one and a half years between when your book actually sells and when it appears on the show. When it comes out, so, yeah. <laughs> right, so even editors don't know that another editor has acquired a book or that a book is about right. to drop that has these themes. So like publishing is, is that's part of the risk of publishing is that you're, you're, taking, you're taking a leap of faith that, mm -hmm. that um, that this is gonna work out. Um, but but I really think like being unique is not as important in publishing. Like that unique idea is, is interesting maybe, but it's mm -hmm. all about the execution. If you cannot tell a good story, then it doesn't matter how good your idea is. And no two writers will, will write the same idea yeah. in the same way. In the same way, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Related to how you were saying earlier, you know, wanting to write from your own experience of the Civil War um, and how you can do that in, in a way that ve very few other people can probably. And, you know, in your particular way, nobody else can write it in the way that you're specifically going to write it. And I think that's just so important for writers to remember that, like, the story that you are going to tell, nobody else can tell that story. Um, Swati has a question um, about um, Kalki's father in Blue Skin Gods, um, wondering about your thoughts about his backstory, um, that he is a man of science, um, or he was a man of science as a doctor, um, and then he changed and became this sort of dogmatic religious leader or dictator. How did you envision that transformation for him? I've seen a lot of scientists become very dogmatic in their religion mm. for well, some reason. I think, you know, if, if your religion, if your faith can survive the kind of, I guess, logistical assault that, sci that being a person of science can put upon it, then, you know, it, it runs deep and, it, mm. uh, and, and some people cling to it, right? Like, because they feel as if they have to. Mm -hmm. um, so I've seen like even my my parents who are research scientists are fairly religious. And mm. um, I've so I've, I've, most of my life, I've seen them do that dance between yeah. like what, you know, what they believe as scientists and what they believe as people of faith. Right. Um, so so like that 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 um, middle space that kind of negotiation is really interesting to me. I think that it reveals a lot about people. It reveals a lot about what they need um, from their faith. So for- And so Bahia, much about identity as well. Like who, mm -hmm. how does a person define who they are right. and how many different angles and facets of that are there? Right. For me, like Kalki's father, you know, and, and people have gotten, this is another thing, like this is why you need to not read your Goodreads reviews. Um, <laughs> people have been upset because Kalki's father doesn't have, a, like, there's no reason given for mm. why he is a jerk um, or why he's, he's sort of a tyrant. But my answer is that there's not always a reason. Some people yeah. are just tyrannical and they oppress everyone around them and there's not and like I think it's simplistic to expect that everybody has this very deep backstory of being hurt and you know and 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 for me like 
for Kelki's father, he he has that kind of personality that that naturally gravitate towards uh, power and wealth, and and is just sort of naturally greedy. But he also fully believes in himself. Like right. He believes he is right at all times, and that he knows what's best for everyone around him. Right. Um, and and you know, it's also important just as a writer to understand that everyone is the hero of their own story. Mm. Uh, that no one thinks of themselves as the tragic backstory villain uh, or the villain with a tragic backstory. Like everyone is is their own hero in their right. own story. And and the story is narrated by adult Kelki. And uh, even if there is this, this, you know, deep backstory to why his dad did what he did, Kelki wouldn't know it. Um, like there's, there is a limit. Yes, the narrator is very wise on the experience, but there is a limit to how much he knows and he can't know why his father did the things that he did, Mm -hmm. at least not in the stage of their relationship that they're at now. Um, I wanted to let you know that um, we had a couple of people um, just grateful for you sharing your experiences in the Civil War and also grateful for understanding um, the backstory of your brother being the narrator or the um, voice actor for the audiobook. So thank you so much for showing, sharing those behind the scenes um, with us. Um, And we have Anne in the chat who's wondering what books you read in your free time. Uh, well, during the school year, I don't have a lot of free time to read. Um, I read the books that I teach, but uh, right now I am reading um, A Passage North, which actually is about the, the Sri Lankan Civil War, and um, it's by Anuk Arupradasam, and it was a finalist for the Booker Prize, and it is fantastic. Everyone should read it. It's, it's The Passage and, and, and North. A, a Passage North, yeah. A Passage yeah. North. Great. It's beautiful. Keep going. I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to make sure that. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Next on my shelf is um, uh, was it the Boat People by Sharon mm-hmm. Bala, um, and Tongue Breaker by Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samra Singha, and um, all three are I'm teaching. I'm reading them because I'm teaching them <laughs> um, in a, a literature of the Tamil diasporas class at the University of Toronto. Um, so I'm really excited to, I, I, I always assign books that I'm excited to read because, you know, that's, that's, that's the way I do pleasure reading during the semester. Makes perfect sense. And are there any particular books that you feel like are sort of in conversation with your book that if our book club members are like, I want, you know, the Pandora app to tell me what book to read next um, before uh, Sindhu's chap book comes out. What could folks read that will sort of feel um, in vibe and in conversation with your books? Uh, I think, and that's hard to answer because I, I was, I, when I tried to look for comp titles for my book and there were none and I was like, no, and it was really difficult. Um, but I would say Mosin Hamid's Exit West is one of my favorite novels. I read it several times while I was writing. Um, also Freshwater, Akweke Amezi's debut novel mm. um, is fantastic and, and deals with a lot of the same issues of identity and, and faith and, and spirituality. Uh, so those two I think are, are the ones I'd recommend. Fantastic. Sindhu, you're, you've been so generous um, and with your time and your information and your stories and your behind the scenes here with us this evening. I'm just really, really grateful um, for being able to share this evening with you, to share it with all of our Beyond the Page um, members and readers. Thank you so much um, for being here with us and for um, your work as well. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you, GBH, for organizing this. This has been I mean, I wish that I could be sitting in Boston right now doing this, but because I, I, I miss Boston so much. Uh, but, uh, but thank you, Teresa, too, for hosting. Absolutely. Um, thank you all for joining us for Beyond the Page this evening. And again, huge thanks to SJ Sindhu for being with us this evening. We are excited to announce that next month's author is Colleen Hoover. Colleen grew to popularity over this past year, selling tens of thousands of copies of books a week, topping the bestsellers list, um, thanks to TikTok. 
Um, hashtag book talk, as it's referred to, um, is a niche following where readers talk about their favorite books. Um, and this helped to launch Colleen's overwhelming success. And she will be the guest author for next month. Keep your eye out for emails to register for that event. And as always, you can join the Beyond the Page Facebook group um, for even more discussion topics as you read through Colleen's work. Details are in the chat and in the event follow-up email, which you will all be receiving. I really hope that you all enjoyed your evening tonight. Um, I enjoyed uh, reading through your questions and seeing your reflections on Sindhu's work. Um, and I'm just really grateful to be able to spend some time with you this evening. So thank you all so much. And I hope you have a fantastic evening. Good night. <laughs>